Good evening, new catamounts and families. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jan Hennis. I'm going to be one of your presenters this evening. I am going to be joined tonight by my colleagues Casey and Terry, who will also be presenters. My colleagues Sean and Kirsten, who are behind the scenes, and our tech guru Aaron this evening. Let's go over our agenda and briefly talk about our format this evening uh, before we get started. We have gathered a lot of commonly asked questions and we're going to go over those this evening in order to help you navigate some of the financial matters that you're going to come across while you're here at UVM. We will have a Q&A session toward the end as well. And we are going to go. Let me talk a little bit. Sorry about that. Let me talk a little bit about our questions and answers. We will also have a Q&A feature, which we're going to open about halfway through this presentation, and I'll make that announcement so you know when it's available. We are going to address as many questions as we can this evening, but we know we're not going to be able to address all of them. While they are, you are putting some questions in our Q&A feature, we're also going to be gathering those questions. We may save some of those to the end so we can answer them to the whole group for everybody's benefit. Please understand that we are not able to address specific financial circumstances this evening. We certainly do want you to contact us and I'm going to pause here on this screen for a moment. You can find a lot of information on our orientation site, which is right there on the screen for the link. You can also email us at uvm.edu forward slash SFS. And you can also stop in and visit us. We're going to have our address up on the screen a little bit later. We're in the Waterman building and we're available for you to drop in between 10 and 430. Before I start, I do want to let you know that this session is being recorded and it will be available soon on our orientation page. So let's dive in. Here's a common question. Where is the bill and when is it due? Our bills are all posted online. Our students can find them in their student portal and our authorized proxy users will find them in their proxy user account. Our due date for the fall bill is Friday, August 16th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. For those of you that are planning ahead, our spring term bills will be available mid-December and will be due 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 10th, 2025. Oof, hard to think we're going that far ahead already. Another common question we get is how do I avoid a late fee and registration hold? Well, the key thing is to make sure that you pay your balance by that due date. There are a couple different ways to do that. We're going to talk over some different payment options for you this evening. We do have a monthly payment plan that you can enroll in. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a few slides. Please keep in mind to keep open communication with us. Maybe you have some funds coming from a 529 or an outside scholarship. Please remember, we don't know about them until you tell us about them. So please communicate with us at any time for some incoming funds at sfs at uvm.edu. That'll help us make sure that that gets noted on your account. We know the mail has been slow lady, lately and some of those things take a little while to get here. We do ask that you plan ahead and take in account that slow mail if something is coming that way, but informing us is always a helpful way to make sure that you don't receive a late fee. Now for our proxy users, they ask where do I log in to view my bill? Well, your proxy account is accessed at go.uvm.edu forward slash proxy and our students have their login as well. And I'm going to pause here just a second to remind you. Proxy users, please use your proxy account. Students, your account is yours, and we're going to ask that you keep those separate. If you have a shared computer at home, 
there is something that happens sometimes. If mom is in her proxy user account and later on the student tries to log into theirs, sometimes it gets a little stuck in the computer. Usually a quick clear of your browser cache takes care of this problem. You may have noticed on your statement, your bill, that you have a comprehensive fee and we get a lot of questions about what exactly is that comprehension fee. This is a fee that helps to support all of the different programs and services that help our students success here at UVM. That can be anything from library, academic support, maybe even visiting speakers on campus. Now, sometimes you're a proxy, but you didn't get an email or any billing and you're wondering why that's not happening. So I'm going to direct this part of my conversation to the students. Students are the ones who set up proxies and they're the only ones that can set up proxies. So for my students who are watching this evening, there's two parts to setting up a proxy. The first part, as you can see on your screen, is the profile. That's where you're going to enter your proxy's name and their relationship and their email. But there's a second part. That second tab that's circled in red says authorization. This is where you get to authorize what types of financial information they can see on your account. There's little check boxes that you need to fill out. Without doing both of these, your proxy will not have access. Now, I do want to remind you, this is a financial proxy. So for students, please be assured this only gives financial access. Your proxies do not have access to your bill. Uh, I'm sorry, not your bills. They can see that. <laughs> they do not have access to your grades or your classes. My apologies. Now with any luck, all of our proxies are set up and everything is okay, but they get a notice that they have to reset their pin. Let me explain how to do this. When, if you are a proxy and you have to reset your pin, you're gonna go into the regular proxy login. You're gonna put in your email address and you're gonna choose forgot pin. This is gonna generate an email to you and it's going to have an action password. Now, this is really important. You do need to copy that action password. That email is going to have a link and you're gonna need that action password to get into that link, but you are also going to need it where you can see on this little second white screen here, it says enter old pin. Now, of course, you can't enter your old pen because you forgot your old pen. That's why you're here in the first place. So that's where you're going to enter that action password. Then you're going to create a new pen. Now, please remember the pen must be at least 16 digits. I'm sorry, at least six digits. Oh my goodness, I should have had coffee before. At least six digits and they are numeric. This is unusual because we are so used to doing passwords with letters and numbers. This is numbers only. How can you make an online payment? Online payments are the quickest way to make a payment to your account. Online payments show up immediately and are credited to your student's account right away. Students have access in their portal and proxies have access in their proxy portal under view account and billing activity and make payments. When you make a payment, I am going to suggest to use that e-check option. An e-check requires your bank routing number and your account number. There is no service fee with this option. Please remember that if you use a credit card or a debit card, there is a 2.85% service fee. I don't love those extra service fees, so I'm going to give you a little tip to avoid them. Guest payers can also make a payment. Now, this doesn't a guest payer does not need to be a proxy. We have a section where guest payers can go in and make a payment with just the student name and their ID number, their 95 number. This is excellent if you have some family members that may want to help out along the line to help with those payments. It's also a great thing to ask for if one of your relatives says, what do you want for your birthday or holiday? Well, how about a little bit of help towards education? Always a good gift. We do have a payment plan. Is it too late to set one up for the fall? 
No, it is not. Our payment plan, you can still set up and get five payments um, if you sign up by July 21st. Our payment plan is per semester. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. There is a $60 fee to set it up. If you sign up by July 21st, it'll be 20% down. That will cover your July payment. And then the payments will automatically pull from the account that you choose um, on the following months. So that means August, September, October, and November, being able to break that balance up for you. Now, as some of you have received your bill, perhaps you're seeing a health insurance charge and you're not quite sure why it's on there. The University of Vermont, like all universities, are required to offer student health insurance. Now, we can get rid of that if you fill out your insurance waiver. If you are currently covered by an insurance plan and you do not need to purchase the UVM offered insurance, there is a insurance waiver that you need to fill out. Now, the original deadline for that was on July 1st, but don't worry, you can still do it. That's just why you're seeing it on your bill. You're going to go to uvm.edu forward slash health forward slash insurance and fill out the waiver form. This will ask you what your current insurance is. And once that waiver is processed through our health and well-being services, that charge will be reversed off of your bill. Don't forget that final waiver deadline is September 15th. Students, this is on your student checklist, so make sure you get this finished. Some of you may be seeing some changes on your bill from the initial um, bill that, that you had. You might be seeing some activity going on. Let me explain a couple of reasons why that may happen. First thing to let you know is that we bill by registration. And what that means is if your student is in the process of shifting some classes, maybe they need to get into a different section or maybe that early class really isn't going to be great for them. You may see on your bill some charges coming off, maybe the comprehensive fee going to a part time fee and then some charges going back on. That's the activity that's going on while your student is settling their final choices for classes. You may also notice some course fees on your bill. Those some classes have specific course fees and you might see those pop on as well. Another reason that you may see some changes on the bill could be because of housing charges. Some students have not received their final housing assignment at this point or just before we created our first fall bill. That means that some students may initially be billed the traditional standard double room rate. When housing assignments are finalized, that charge may be adjusted based on the final housing assignment. Can I get an updated bill to show those changes you were just talking about on the account? Well, here's some great news. You already have access to it and I'm going to show you where to find it. First thing I want to remind you is our statement is static. That means that when we create it, it is a capture in a moment of time of the charges and aid or payments that were on that day. Anything that happens after the day we create that statement is not going to show up and be updated on that statement. But don't worry, you have access. You can go either our students into their student account, proxies into their proxy user account, and go to view account and billing activity. This is going to give you a more up to the moment um, view of what's going on with your account, seeing some of those payments that you might have made or some of those charge changes. Once you're on this screen, you're going to click the little carrots on this left side of that and it'll drop down and it'll show you a full list of all of the payments. Now you can certainly save this screen, print this screen. People need some updated payments for all reasons, but you have access to an up to date bill right at your fingertips. Some of the aid may be listed on your bill as pending, and you might be wondering, what does that mean? 
there's a couple different reasons that aid might be listed as pending. It may actually be too early for that payment to be added to your account. One place where this is very common is with any federal aid. Federal aid cannot pay to a student's account until 10 days before classes start. For us, that means August 16th. Now don't panic, we know that's the bill date. We'll make sure to get that aid on your account and applied before that happens, before that 430 deadline. Other reasons that it might not be there is because there may be some additional action needed in order for the aid to be finalized. Now, my colleague Casey is going to talk a little bit more about loans very, very soon, and she can inform you of all the things that you need to do just in case you have some pending aid and you have some action items to complete. Now at this point in our presentation, we are at about that halfway point. At this point, we are going to open our question and answer feature. And I'm going to turn the presentation over now to my colleague Casey, who is going to talk to you a little bit more about federal work study and a variety of different loan options. Casey? Hello, um, I'm Casey. Um, so to start my part of the presentation, um, we'll go over um, question, why is my federal work study offer not on the bill? Um, the big thing with federal work study is um, it is paid to the student um, directly. Um, this is oftentimes a, a biweekly paycheck, um, which is paid direct by direct deposit. Um, federal work study funds um, don't exist until they're earned, so um, it's important to keep in mind that um, when you're planning on um, funds to be able to um, pay towards your August bill um, for the fall semester, um, the work study funds um, shouldn't be um, taken into account for, for um, paying that bill. Um, what we suggest is um, to kind of use those funds that you earn um, students um, towards like miscellaneous expenses um, or spending money that you'll need um, while you're here on campus um, or maybe um, consider um, saving your your um, pay um, to pay towards your um, spring semester books. Um, and another common question is, how do I get hired for a work, um, a federal work study job? Um, the first thing is you would need to accept your um, federal work study offer, um, and that would be through your student portal um, at my UVM, um, sorry, myuvm.uvm.edu. Um, um, the, these, again, um, you can't pay, um, towards your August bill, so you'll want to keep in mind that um, in order to secure a job, you'll want to look on the JobX um, database, and that is available on the MyUVM portal as well. Um, the big deadline for Federal Work Study is um, August, or sorry, October 1st um, at 4.30 p.m. So you'll want to make sure that you um, look at all the jobs, um, make sure that you um, get hired before then, um, and make sure that it, it shows um, in order to um, keep that um, the eligibility to be able to earn those, those funds. Um, you can locate that um, by going to uvm.edu forward slash student employment. Um, if for some reason you miss this deadline, um, there are other work study job or sorry, there are other employment opportunities on campus um, and are available through that same job portal, um, JobX. Um, so you can look there for um, those. Um, and then also um, around town, um, we're in close proximity to Church Street, um, which offers a lot of different employment opportunities. Um, so you want to keep your eye out there um, if for some reason you miss um, the deadline or if you aren't offered um, work study. Um, 
another big question. Um, so um, we're kind of moving towards loans now. Um, so one of the big biggest questions is what's the difference between the subsidized and unsubsidized direct um, student loan? Um, the, the differences kind of lie with how your uh, the interest accrues. Um, so for the subsidized federal direct loan, um, while you're in, if, if you are offered this loan um, while you're in school, um, enrolled at least half time, um, you would not accrue interest, meaning that you, you yourself um, would not be um, responsible for that um, until you either drop below half time um, or um, you graduate and, and the repayment would start um, six months after one of those two. Um, the, uh, direct subsidized loan is a need-based loan, so um, that's based on your um, FAFSA. So um, if you aren't offered that, you would likely be offered um, the unsubsidized loan, um, which I'll talk about now. Um, so this is a non-need-based loan, but you do have to file a FAFSA in order to be eligible to borrow this type of loan. Um, the interest on this loan, it accrues um, as soon as um, it originates. So once the money hits your account, um, it starts to um, er, um, accrue interest um, from there. Um, in terms of how, how you would be able to borrow this loan, um, you would first need to um, fill out the FAFSA. Um, a part of your uh, aid offer, you would likely get um, offered federal loans. Um, in order to have that paid to your account, you would need to complete three steps. Um, first, you would need to accept the loan um, or part of the loan, um, and that would be through your UVM portal. Um, once you've accepted, um, you'll then be um, um, asked to complete loan entrance counseling and a master promissory note, um, which are both to be completed on uh, studentaid.gov. Um, the login for this um, would be the same, um, F it's the FSA ID that you used um, to submit your FAFSA. So you'll log in using that um, same ID and then the password that you used. Um, so if you have any trouble with that, you'll want to contact um, the help center there. Um, another question that a lot of people have is uh, why is the direct loan on the bill less than the award um, that I was given? Um, so a big thing with federal loans uh, or federal student loans is um, that they have an origination fee, um, which means that the federal government takes um, a portion of the um, loan um, off the top um, for the subsidized and unsubsidized loans. Um, that is a 1.057% per, uh, um, fee. Um, so that means that about like if you borrow a thousand dollars, the government will only send uh, 990 to UVM. Um, similarly, um, the federal direct uh, parent plus loan, um, it does have a higher origination fee, um, which is 4.228%. Um, so if you think about it the same way, you borrow a thousand, UVM gets 958. Um, and that, that's what would show up on your bill, not the 1,000. Um, why is the scholarship from my community not listed on my bill? Um, so like Jan said earlier in the presentation, um, you do have to notify us of any um, scholarships that you have, because um, we don't know until you tell us. Um, big thing to do is um, if you are getting scholarship checks written out to you um, yourself as a student, um, you would want to make sure that if you wanted it to go towards your um, bill, um, you would want to sign over the um, check. Uh, so you'd sign it with your name and then sign it over uh, as payable to UVM. Um, and on the check, you would want to make sure that it has your name and your ID number. Um, scholarship 
checks and letters um, can be sent to uh, Student Financial Services, uh, 223 Waterman Building in Burlington, Vermont, 05405. Um, you can also email us um, to let us know if you have the letter. Um, that, that's a good way to, to let us know about those scholarships. Um, another common question is, how can I use financial aid and loans to pay for books? Um, so a lot of times um, with financial aid, um, there is a, a way that um, like you, you'd get enough aid to cover your build costs. Um, with that, um, any excess charges, um, or sorry, any excess funds after those charges have been paid for, um, those can get refunded to you. Um, so it's important to make sure to set up a direct deposit. Um, this is something that the student will need to do um, in order to, um, to receive those funds. Um, in terms of um, that, you'd want to do that through your MyUVM portal. Um, and any financial refunds, um, they, they would be processed the week of August 19th. Um, we, we strongly suggest you have a plan um, to purchase books outside of this um, just because um, there's not a guarantee um, that the funds will actually be received um, before the start of class. Um, Another common question we get is, how do I borrow a federal direct parent plus loan? Um, how much do I need to borrow? Um, the parent plus loan is a credit based loan um, and it is in the parent's name. Um, the parent borrower would um, apply at studentaid.gov using the same um, FSA ID that they used um, to complete the FAFSA. Um, it is available up to the cost of attendance, less any other aid. Um, so meaning that if you get get aid outside of um, that, you, you can only get up to the cost of attendance. Um, and it's also important. Um, so if you say you have a $10,000 balance, um, you would want to make sure that you borrow more um, in order to cover the origination fee. Um, so if you have a $10,000 balance, you'd want to borrow $10,441 um, to cover that balance. Um, you can use the bill estimator tool at uh, go.uvm, sorry, yeah, go.uvm.edu forward slash estimate your bill. And uh, what are the terms of the federal direct parent plus loan? Um, so the Parent PLUS loan has a 10-year repayment period that um, initially starts um, as soon as you borrow it. Um, there is an option to defer um, repayment, um, but keep in mind that this loan does accrue interest as soon as it originates. So um, the interest rate for this year is 9.08%. Um, so you'll want to make sure that you um, keep that in mind. You can make interest only payments on these loans um, and that goes for student loans as well. Um, so if if you have an unsubsidized loan, you can you can pay interest only payments um, so that it doesn't get added on um, once you start repayment. How can excess uh, plus loan funds be used um, by my student to buy books? Um, so like I said in the previous slide, um, there um, you have the ability to borrow a parent plus loan up to the cost of attendance, which includes both billable costs and then non billable costs. Um, if you want the um, loan um, funds, the refund to go towards your student, um, go to them directly, you would need to make sure that you um, select the box um, that says refund to student. Um, otherwise, um, the parent would get a refund check, uh, a physical check um, sent to the um, address um, that you set up um, when you were applying for that loan. Um, what is a private private education loan and how do I learn more about borrowing this loan? Um, so private education loans can be um, used to um, 
cover a portion of your bill or um, the cost of attendance outside of um, what UVM can offer or the federal government. Um, it is a, um, a lot of these are credit based loans. So um, as a student, um, you generally would need a co-signer. Um, there are also um, private education loans that are available to parents. Um, and on our website, um, we do have a loan comparison tool called Elm Select um, to be able to know how much you need to borrow. Um, you can use the estimator tool, um, which is the go.uvm.eu forward slash estimate your bill. Um, and if you go to um, our website, you can um, just search or um, go to um, go.uvm.edu forward slash private private loan um, or you can just search private loans and that'll get you to the, the, the same place. And um, so at this point, um, we'll be um, turning over the um, presentation over to Terry. Um, she'll be talking about um, appeals and um, things to look ahead um, in the future. Thank you, Casey. That was very helpful. And Jeanne, appreciate your introduction. Um, yes, I would like to start with just the 529 savings plan as a payment method. Um, if you have an educational fund, um, we um, suggest that you request your distribution from that uh, organization early for the due date of the fall semester. If you are requesting a payment, you would need to notify that agency of the student's 95 UVM ID number and their name. It's important to get that on the check memo line with that organization because every time a check comes into our lockbox, it's immediately processed. Um, our lockbox address um, is where you would send it. It's University of Vermont. P.O. Box 1306, and it's in Williston, Vermont, a nearby town, 05495. If you put Burlington, Vermont, it's going to be delayed. So just want to bring that to your attention. The other thing is the um, organization is going to offer you to pay extra for overnight delivery, and that actually may delay your payment because a lockbox cannot accept an overnight delivery. So let us know that you've requested your 529 plan. Email us and then we will make a notation on the account so that if there is delay in processing it, it doesn't reach us by August 16th, we will know about it and can avoid that late payment fee. So how do I no notify uh, our office if my family's financial circumstances have changed. And there is change. We recognize that um, the FAFSA does look at two years prior to the date of attendance. So we're looking at 2022 income. It's very possible that your family's resources have changed due to a change in your family structure, a change of employment, illness, um, something that has happened. Um, we ask that you email us um, just a brief um, uh, email to sfs at uvm.edu. Let us know what has happened. If you could provide a date, that would be very helpful. Um, I'd ask that you not send any private um, sensitive information by email. We will review your initial email then we will ask your you to upload some information. I'm getting ahead of myself here um, to the student's record so that your information remains confidential and secure. And here we are. So uploading documents um, for a special circumstance of the appeal. We will put out a request to your student and they will log into their student portal and they will see the financial aid card 
and select view my requirements and there will be a link that will take them into this secure verification portal with tasks there and they will upload documents or complete some online forms. We ask that you review for completion and signatures and some forms if it's a dependent student the parent will also be invited to electronically sign those forms by the student. When, how, uh, when will I know about the status of my special circumstances appeal? So we will send notify you of the results of the appeal. Um, hopefully that will provide more need based aid to the student and the family. Um, if the appeal is approved, the student would log into their UVM portal and see any revisions to their financial aid offer. Um, it's important to note that um, in this year of change, um, the FAFSA, um, we have just received permission from the uh, Department of Education to begin to be able to make changes to the data of the FAFSA record. And so appeals may not be ready in time for the August 16th bill, but we will process them and if aid is available, it will be um, awarded for the fall semester. So we would ask you to review your account now and make plans to pay the bill with other means and then we can adjust that at a later point in time if the appeal is approved. Again, I got ahead of myself here. <laughs> What if my appeal request is not processed in time for the bill due date? We are reviewing them as quickly as we can. Um, and again, it may not be ready in time for the due date. So we'd ask you to use your current financial aid award for planning and, and bill payment while it's being considered. So occasionally a student um, does need to withdraw from the university. Something has, you know, happened and hopefully this this isn't your situation, but if it is, I would like to make you aware of our tuition refund schedule. If a student does need to withdraw in the first two weeks of the semester, that would classes begin August 26th and so by September 9th 100% of the tuition and fees would be canceled from the student's account. Um, that is for medical and non-medical withdrawals. If a student um, something happens between September 10th and September 16th, that's the date of withdrawal, then 50% of the tuition and fees will be canceled and so on and so forth for the next uh, period of time would be 25%. Um, but please note that after September 23rd, there would be no refund of the tuition and fees for the semester, they would be fully due. If a student does withdraw within this time period though, and they are a residential student, the housing and meal plans will be prorated or adjusted for the time that they lived on campus. And after the 23rd, the full uh, residential fees would also be um, outstanding. Now, if we are adjusting tuition, we would also be adjusting financial aid. So I want to keep that in mind that um, if a student is considering withdrawing, it's good to talk with our office about the that impact. Do I have to file the FAFSA annually to receive my merit scholarship? No, you've earned that merit scholarship. Congratulations. Um, that is guaranteed for up to eight semesters. Um, the requirements are that you maintain full time enrollment. That's 12 credits or more for the fall and the spring semesters. Um, the requirement of a cumulative GPA of 3.0 or greater um, is evaluated. So 
we'll go a full year, fall and spring, and at the end of the spring semester, we'll look at that cumulative GPA. If it's at 3.0, then the scholarship is renewed for the upcoming second year. How do I maintain eligibility for need-based and federal financial aid? So with the FAFSA, that is what determines um, the financial need of a student. It's called the SAI, the Student Aid Index. Um, and that number looks at the family finances. If it's a dependent student, if it's an independent student, it would look at the student's resources. Um, and awards may change based on changes in fi family finances. So it's important to um, file the FAFSA each year so that we can review and make financial offers to you. Another important thing to, to remember is that financial aid does require that the student is making academic progress. We call it satisfactory academic progress, SAP for short not the maple syrup kind. Um, what this means is that the student is progressing towards their degree. Um, they need to complete 67% of their credits attempted so that a student that is enrolling in classes but withdrawing from them during the semesters, if they're frequently doing that, their completion rate will be dropping. So we want to make sure that they're aware of that and work with their academic advisors in the college and make a good plan each semester to not overwhelm themselves with courses, but enough challenging courses so that they are advancing towards their goals. And that brings us to the end of this part of the presentation. And I would like to introduce my colleague Kirsten, who will be has been gathering questions in the background, and we will be happy to answer those at this time. We want you to know that we are here to help. Our contact information is here, as Jan had indicated earlier. We have um, a lot of videos at our orientation page. You can email us, you may call us. Um, the office here in Waterman 223 is open 10 to 430, Monday through Friday. Um, you can call before that time. Please know we are here working at 8 a.m. We are doing uh, processing time during those early hours. Thank you, Terry. The first question I have is regarding a 529 plan. Uh, we have quite a few folks that are asking if 529 plan payments can be sent electronically versus mailing a paper check. That's a great question. I think it's challenging to mail them electron or send them electronically. And the reason is it's going to go into the greater university treasury um, uh, electronic fund and then get processed. So we really recommend that a paper check be sent to our lockbox rather than um, trying to obtain that um, checking and routing information and having it processed that way. All right, we do have a couple of parents that have been set up as a proxy, but they're having trouble getting it to work. Um, could you maybe offer some advice for how to troubleshoot for proxy access? Sure. Um, so the first thing I would check is that uh, their student has authorized them and identified their relationship as a proxy. That sometimes is the first initial um, uh, step I would take. So the student enters their email address and they um, then the student would then expand on their proxy's name and they would check off the re um, the uh, authorization tab and hit all the boxes so that they have access to accounts receivable which would be we could talk with them about their student account 
and the financial aid boxes so that we could talk about their financial aid offer. If that's all done, then the parent gets an email, they log in and they create a PIN, um, which is all um, numeric, no alpha. Um, so sometimes I said just maybe um, a special date, an anniversary date would be the PIN of the parent or um, other party. The um, other thing I would recommend is to, um, we did talk about the cash. Um, if you're regist uh, signing in on the same computer, um, that it fully logging out the other user if they're not getting in. If that's not working, I certainly would ask you to email our office, sfs at uvm.edu, and we would ha be happy to do a Teams call with you to determine how to resolve the login issue. Uh, a screenshot is helpful too, so that we can um, review and get that taken care of with you because that can be very frustrating. And I'm sorry that you're having that experience. Thanks, Terry. Um, we have someone asking if they can change the amount of the loan that they had planned to borrow that they already accepted and were approved for um, if they did not account for the origination fee. Sure, that's on a Parent PLUS loan, I'm presuming, with the origination fee. Yes, they can go back into studentaid.gov and they would click on Apply for a PLUS loan and there's a button there that says, I would like to make an adjustment to my loan. Now, if um, they aren't sure of the amount that they would like to borrow additionally, we could use our billing estimator that's on our UVM website to calculate the differential for the origination fee, the amount that they're short, because they wouldn't want to short it again with the origination fee on that amount. Um, the other thing I'd say is um, give us a call, give us an email, and we'll be happy to help you too. This one is a two parter. Um, okay. This family is wondering if they will receive any other bills during the 24 25 year besides the current bill for the fall semester and the spring semester billed in December. And then part two of that is they can they assume that the spring bill will be roughly equivalent to the fall bill? Okay, that's that's a good question. My crystal ball is a little cloudy though today. Um, the the bill would be accurate um, with the caveat that if the student isn't changing residence halls or changing their meal plan or collecting library books and not returning them and there's some library fines, things like that. Um, yes, the fall bill should be complete. Um, the only changes would be those change of fees if the student is adding and dropping courses. Course fees would be removed uh, from the bill. If the student is adding insurance or waiving insurance, those are other adjustments. Um, just so the families know, we do present uh, a statement monthly if there's any change on the bill. So that would be coming to the student and any proxies that are identified that they would be identified by email that there is a bill out there for them to review. The spring part of that question is, yes, the bill is generally the same for the spring semester, give or take a dollar um, with the um, odd award amounts. So if an award ends in a five, uh, one semester is going to have a dollar more than the other. Um, the only difference would be is if the student has been awarded several outside scholarships and those are dispersed um, only in the spring semester or only in the fall semester, that would account for a differential on the um, fall and spring bill. 
All right. Um, this catamount is wondering if we recommend that they apply or accept their full year financial aid um, upfront or if they should do it on a semester basis. Accepting their loans, I presume, and work study, maybe? Yes. Okay. Um, it's, it's certainly a personal decision if they have other resources. Um, the loan, if they are going to accept the loan, they could accept it for both semesters. It is always possible to make a change if the loan, um, if they accept the loan in the fall and then they realize they do not need it for the spring semester. I do want to be cautious though with the federal work study is that if a student does not accept their award by October 1st, that award will be canceled. So it's very important that if they do want that option to work a work study position, they do need to accept that award. If they don't want to accept the fall award, only the spring award, they need to send an email to us indicating that so that we reserve that spring award for them. All right, this attendee is wondering um, if you could explain a little bit more about what the down payment is in regard to the monthly payment plan um, and the time frame for when um, those are due. Sure, sure. So for the fall semester, the maximum payment plan is a five month payment plan that began July 1st. So that would be um, sign up for the payment plan and then it's auto debited to the account that the person registers and enrolls in the payment plan. Um, hopefully they're not using a credit card which would incur a 2.85% additional fee. So if um, someone read, enrolls in the payment plan by July 21st, they will be asked to make that first payment for July, that July 20% um, down one fifth, and then they would have four remaining payments. August 1st, the auto debit would occur, so it's gonna come close, those first two payments, then, um, August, September, October, and November 1st. That would, November 1st is the end of the fall payment. Then the spring plan would begin December 1st through April 1st. So if family doesn't register for the payment plan by July 21st, they can register up to between those dates to August 23rd and at that point they would have a four payment plan where 25% would be down due at the time they enroll. 25% down is one fourth and then they would have three more payments September 1st, October 1st and November 1st. If the parents of a student happen to be divorced and are planning to apply for private loans or PLUS loans, what is the process for that? Does each parent need to apply for their own loan? Ah, that's a, that's a really good question. So many of our families are with two households and each are contributing to their child's education. So it's really um, the choice of the family, how they would like to do it. So here's some options. Um, a student would apply for a private loan and identify a co-signer. Is it possible that they would have one parent do one semester and the other parent do another semester? Or would they do two loans with each parent in the same semester, I guess, if that's um, not too confusing. That's um, also something to consider with the payment plan, if I could um, go answer that a little bit. I know this has come up. So if, if we have two households and the student wishes to do a payment plan, there are two options there um, with the 
we can only have one payment plan per student. So one parent could do one semester, the other parent could do the second semester, or the student can um, create the payment plan with a separate account and the two parents can contribute their portion to that account and that payment plan would auto debit from the student's joint account that the parents are contributing to. Can you pay the interest on an unsubsidized loan while a student is still in school and do they do that through us or through the federal site? That's a great question. So to keep that loan from growing while the student is enrolled, yes, you can make interest only payments on the unsubsidized loan. You don't have to, but you can. Um, so once that student, the student uh, loan is paid to UVM, then the federal government is going to assign a loan servicer. It's a company that will manage the repayment of that loan and the billing once the student is graduated and repaying it. So they would contact the servicer and they would in, uh, indicate that they would like to make a payment. They can do that, um, create an online um, link to the, the servicer and that servicer will be notifying the student um, of, of um, their contact information. That also will be listed at studentaid.gov under the student's login once the servicer is established. It takes about um, 40 days after the loan is paid before the servicer is connected to the loan. If an outside scholarship is received after the semester has already started, how do we handle that? Does it still get deducted from tuition? Well, the, the payment would be applied to the student's account as um, a, uh, a payment source. And if it overpays the account, we can refund the student um, with the direct deposit signed up whichever account they enter, the student can enter a bank account information there, whether it's the student's individual account or a parent account, whatever they would like to enter. Um, the other thing is a student can, if they send in a, um, an outside scholarship at a later point, they can also ask us to keep it on the account for a future semester's payment. We do have a couple questions asking um, for clarification regarding merit scholarship renewal policies and what happens if a scholarship were to be terminated. Yes, that is um, a challenge. So it's not lost um, is what I'd like to say is that um, the uh, we renew we review at the end of the spring, as I indicated after the first year, if the student is not making that 3.0 mark, then the scholarship is uh, removed for a year and that student can remain enrolled and work back to get to the 3.0 as long as they're still in their undergraduate degree program, that scholarship can be returned to them in the third year and fourth year. Do we offer tuition insurance? We do not offer tuition insurance. Um, there is there are some private agencies that uh, families can contact about that, but we have not um, offered that. Will community or outside scholarships affect the amount of my merit scholarship, like the presidential scholarship? No, it would not impact a merit scholarship award. I guess the only time it would impact a merit scholarship award if it was very significant. So uh, there's the cost of attendance budget that um, is all the costs associated with the student attending and then they have a um, uh, a need indicator, that SAI number that I mentioned, uh, the student aid index. 
the difference between those two numbers is financial need. And so a student can have um, uh, outside scholarships up to the total cost of attendance. Do all private loans need to be paid before the due date or is a commitment letter from the lender sufficient if the timing is tight? So we ask that the private loan application be completed and the student or parent, I, I guess it would be the student because the private loan is probably in their name, um, although there are some parent private loans. As long as they have uh, completed the application, we can wait for those funds to come in. Um, with every private loan, we are notified by the lender to certify the amount fits into the student's financial aid budget with their other aid. So we generally are notified if it's getting close to that time, the due date, August 16th, we ask that they contact us by email with the amount. Don't have to prove to us with a, a letter of commitment to say I'm borrowing X loan from of this amount for the for the year or for the fall semester. And we will notate that on the account to avoid that late payment fee and clear the account. Is the UVM out of state grant or need based grant considered a merit scholarship and do the same rules apply? That UVM um, grant is a need-based award and that is um, awarded to a student based on their need indicator from the FAFSA. So it has um, the uh, rules for satisfactory academic progress to be maintain eligibility and to maintain academic standing with their college, but it does not um, uh, follow the requirements for the merit scholarships of a cumulative 3.0 that we review in the springtime. This parent is wondering how they can accept their students loans in their student portal. I'm sorry, the question again was a student accepting or a parent accepting? The parent wants to know if they can accept a student's aid for ah, them. <laughs> thank you. That's why I, I was asking. Um, a parent cannot accept a, a loan um, for a student. The student is accepting the loan. Those are student action steps. And it is a legal document that the student is signing with the Department of Education. So it's very important that the student complete those documents rather than the parent. They need to have the awareness of the financial obligation and their rights and responsibilities as a federal borrower. I think we have time for about one more question, Kirsten, if you'd like to uh, choose one. All right, let me pick the best one here. <laughs> These have been great questions tonight. Thank you so much. All right, so this parent is wondering if they can pay in installments kind of outside of that monthly payment plan, or do they have to have the entire bill settled um, by the um, bill due date in August? Yes, uh, so we do need to have a plan for payment, full payment with a payment plan or other source of funding by the due date. So it is a formal payment plan that the, the family would need to um, commit to um, or a loan. Sometimes our families do part loan, part payment plan with a number that may fit into their monthly budget. Um, if there's any um, discussion or or review that is needed, we would be happy to uh, uh, counsel you about um, your options. You certainly can email us and we can arrange um, to speak with you about um, what is possible for payment. 
OK, I'd like to thank you very much for attending this evening. Um, as Jan indicated, this session will be prepared with captioning and then posted at our orientation page, which is on the screen at the moment. It all will also be on this new student um, uh, orientation page. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not thinking of the name. New student insight sessions. <laughs> It's a tongue twister. Thanks again.